Okay, uh, welcome to everyone here today uh, for this sustainability seminar. As most of you know, my name is Nancy Holm. I'm assistant director here at ISTC and the seminar organizer along with Beth Mischewski. The theme for uh, this fall's seminar uh, series is uh, contaminants in the environment. And information on the seminars can be found on the side table as you entered the uh, room here, or it's also posted on the ISTC website for those listening to the broadcast today. And we have videotapes of the seminars are archived on our website, usually about a week or so after the presentations. Uh, with that, we'll begin today's seminar. I would like to ask everyone here uh, to please silence your cell phones if you have not done so already. And also, we'll hold uh, questions to the end for the speaker. Uh, and then I'll uh, come around with the microphone so we can uh, also record those so everyone can hear those online. And then for those viewing online, you may type your questions in at any time and then we'll answer those at the end also. So we're very pleased today to welcome as our speaker uh, from Minnesota, uh, Al Ennis, and he's with the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. For the past six of his 21 years at the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, Al has been leading the agency's initiatives to support safer product chemistries which reduce the environmental loadings of hazards. Prior to this work, Al has led several uh, MPCA initiatives using pollution prevention and environmental uh, management system approaches in permitting inspections, self and third party auditing, and performance based initiative programs. He has delivered pollution prevention assistance through grants, outreach, training, both at MPCA and in the nonprofit sector previously. Al's five years from 1982 to 87, uh, working in production and wastewater management at Twin Cities electroplating firm, propelled him into his work with pollution prevention. Al is a graduate of the University of Minnesota in the Twin Cities. Today, Al will discuss Minnesota's efforts in their initiative on contaminant reduction through safer product chemistry. With that, I'll turn it over to you, Al. And thanks very much, Nancy, and uh, hello, everyone from St. Paul, Minnesota, on a very bright and crisp fall afternoon. Glad to be with you. Sorry, I can't be there in person. Um, hopefully, our technology will work, and you will see slides advance. This is my plan for the next 40 minutes or so is to uh, give you some background on what we've been doing in green and safer product chemistry in Minnesota, and then describe some of the projects uh, which we have been undertaking to address uh, emerging contaminants or maybe familiar contaminants from emerging or sort of under the radar uh, um, uses. So, uh, sort of emergent uh, in one way or another. And uh, you see the three, the thermally printed papers, the pavement sealants, and the detergents, uh, the salt and winter pavement maintenance. Uh, I don't think I will be able to get to, but since I prepared all those slides, um, I, I left them on the, on the uh, presentation, so if you're able to uh, access it by uh, internet later on, then you'll get a, a sense as, as to what we're doing in, in road salt. So um, I don't think we'll get to that, but just uh, an extra bonus. Um, so in recent years, we've, as, as Nancy mentioned, uh, over the past six plus now, um, have been trying to work preventively to reduce the use and presence of problematic chemicals and products, uh, chemicals and products which after their life cycle or even during their life cycle tend to move into the environment or into the human body as uh, contaminants of emerging concern. And to, uh, in the process of this work, we're basically trying to leverage and bolster drivers which are out there in the, in the marketplace already. And these are probably uh, fairly familiar to some of you that uh, the drivers uh, acting on towards safer chemistry and products um, is greater monitoring and study 
um, both in the environment, um, the presence of chemicals, their effect on organisms, and a study of humans as well, presence and uh, possibility of a biological effect. So more study and more advanced study as well, more advanced techniques um, have definitely uh, been driving the awareness and the concern and the push for even more study of these issues. And um, of course, rising consumer awareness and activism kind of springing out of the monitoring and study um, and the company reactions, um, red lists or restricted lists, uh, more and more companies um, paying attention to the, the worst of the worst and trying to get them out of their products and out of uh, their supply chain. Um, major buyers, again, uh, requiring disclosure from supply chains, alliances of major buyers and brands, product testing by either the buyers, the regulators, or activists. Uh, all these sources are, are new information on uh, what's actually in products on the shelf. And then uh, uh, audits by buyers of their suppliers and then use of third-party certifications like Safer Choice and Green Seal are uh, all kind of drivers and or tools which uh, are, are in the marketplace now, uh, motivating people towards safer chemistry. And basically we're trying to uh, support these, leverage these, uh, build them up more. I think uh, our agency does a lot of environmental monitoring. Um, we are working on uh, to increase consumer awareness issues. We work with companies. We work with alliances of companies. We are um, moving some into limited amounts of product testing, and we uh, promote the uh, third-party certifications which are out there. So that's um, an overview of how we're interacting with the market. And, and these are key sectors, again, probably familiar. Most of these are consumer facing or um, facing people in their workplace. So children's, personal care, clothing, home and office maintenance, building products, food and beverage packaging, things like that are uh, sectors which are getting the most attention from consumers and, um, and, and prompting the good reaction, I think, from uh, the companies supplying products in those sectors. And uh, if it isn't uh, clear, I, I believe that these, this kind of work connects to sustainability, um, of course. Uh, and in general, the consumer-facing firms have already started integrating toxicity reduction, safer product chemistry uh, uh, initiatives into their corporate sustainability programs. In other sectors, uh, it can be not so visible um, in, in comparison to climate or water kinds of issues, um, social investment kinds of issues, which you can see in a corporate sustainability report. Um, or sometimes it's, it's downplayed. Um, efforts are out there, but not really being featured because sometimes companies have is issues, have difficulty talking about um, their, their work on uh, addressing toxicity issues in their products. And uh, sustainability um, is necessary, of course, because of rising population. And as that population rises and gets more, uh, more wealthy, then there's more products and more chemistry. Um, so we're only going upwards in terms of uh, chemical consumption and use. I'm not anti-chemistry by any means. I'm just pro-green chemistry, and I, I think that uh, eventually green chemistry will be mainstreamed. 96% um, on, the, on the screen there refers to uh, a statistic I've seen where it's estimated that 96% of products have some chemistry in their formulation or a formulation of some component, like a surface coating or a, a lubricant or whatever. Um, so chemistry is, is ubiquitous in our products and, uh, you know, we're not aiming to get rid of chemistry. We're aiming, like, we can have good products with good green chemistry. That's our goal. Um, and then sustainability, um, we cannot hand a legacy of toxics 
especially persistent bioaccumulative and toxic uh, chemicals in in our uh, in our food chains and our environment off to the future. That uh, seems to be very core to sustainability concepts. And um, full impacts of humans and ecosystems are unknown at this point, but more research, the greater study shows that changes, reactions um, within ecosystems and humans are are becoming more evident. So this is uh, these are many reasons to integrate this into our sustainability efforts and to act in a preventive way. And this just sort of shows the kinds of things we're investing in um, at the center, reducing loadings and effects, of course, is, is the, the highest uh, goal. Um, we set priorities, we work on policy, we work on uh, hopefully future policy, but definitely past policy like uh, statutes regulating products uh, with chemicals. We work through partners. We do monitoring and compliance oversight, uh, as a, especially the monitoring, um, trying to move more into some of the compliance oversight. Uh, work on some of the projects on the upper left quadrant there, those are your, what you're going to hear more about today. And then on the bottom, we've invested much in, um, over the years in grants to faculty, college faculty, Minnesota college faculty, to integrate concepts of green chemistry into their curricula, either chemistry or engineering to this point, but it could be uh, other disciplines as well. And just building capacity in, in companies, trying to support through uh, financial assistance to companies who want to take on green chemistry projects. Um, unfortunately, it, it struck me as I was looking at this kind of map that uh, everything but that one hexagon on the bottom is really talking about current chemistry and addressing uh, things as they are now and uh, we're only really investing on, in the future down in that one hexagon. So. Um, Hopefully that shifts over time as, as, uh, as the investments and the changes start to ripple through. But, uh, but there's plenty of do, to do to address uh, what's, what's in products or what has been. Um, so with that overview of, of our program in place, um, the first project I wanted to uh, run over was the thermally printed papers. And as you may know, there's uh, concerns about bisphenol A in uh, thermal, thermally printed papers, receipts, um, and, and lottery tickets, and what have you like that. And uh, as we got into this, having heard about the concerns about bisphenol A, turns out the primary substitute three or four years ago at least was bisphenol S. And um, BPS is uh, has questions around it as well, so um, we eventually uh, ended up working on both BPA and BPS in this project. But here are just an overview of some of the impacts that uh, BPA presents, um, affecting the health of humans and aquatic life. It's an endocrine active compound. It has been linked to obesity, breast cancer, developmental issues, early onset of puberty, uh, reduces ability to re reproduce in aquatic species and um, there's since BPS is such a uh, well used uh, substitute for BPA in thermal paper um, it's getting more research now and there are um, indications that there could be similar concerns uh, due in part to its similar molecular structure Basics of BPA, it's a, it's a very high production volume chemical, 14 billion pounds a year, and probably more by now, used worldwide in polycarbonate resins and especially coatings like the, the thermal uh, paper coatings. Um, unfortunately, present uh, in biomonitoring, it's found in 95% of, uh, of Americans at least. Um, we find it in Minnesota, and I think it's found by the U.S. Geological Survey elsewhere in surface waters, even remote lakes in Minnesota. Um, it degrades fairly readily, but because of the uh, nature of continual inputs, 
uh, there have been studies recently which have classed it as quote unquote pseudo, pseudo persistent that uh, because of the continual inputs levels will remain fairly consistent over time and at levels which can create uh, impacts. Um, it's moved into groundwater via leaking landfills. We, even though it degrades fairly readily, we do find it in sediments where there's little oxygen. And uh, in fish, along with other endocrine active compounds, um, we have seen dozens of genetic changes in, in, in the indicator species of fish in, in our biomonitoring in Minnesota. Um, oh, this is just a little uh, graphic to show you how thermal paper works when the heat goes over the, uh, the layer on top of the paper. It's in the base paper and then the coated layer and then the stylus above. Um, it, uh, the BPA facilitates the activation of the dye and uh, then therefore shows up. Um, as, as a dark line. So this is the reason if you want to test if something has a, is a thermally printed paper, you can uh, also run your fingernail over it to scratch it and you'll, you'll, you'll make a black mark as well. The whole surface, sometimes on some types of paper, both sides are coated. Other uh, types, other, other providers will just coat one side, but you have to have at least one side totally coated so it will print wherever you want it to print as, as you're familiar with, with uh, receipts and uh, coupons that come along with them and so on. Um, so what do we know? Cashiers have more BPA in their blood and urine. Uh, the BPA is uh, readily available. It's unbound in the receipts. Since it's um, on that surface layer, it's readily transferred to skin and absorbed through the skin into the bloodstream. Uh, transfer and uptake are facilitated by moisture, sanitizers, lotions, and grease. So that, that doesn't help much in, a, in many work settings. Um, 10 to 60% of BPA on, BPA on hands will be absorbed. Less chemical on the unprinted side, sometimes no chemical. Um, the design for the environment, DFE program, and BPA did an alternatives assessment study in uh, 2012 and 2013 and published results in 2014. And out of, oh, I think it was close to 20 alternatives, um, could not, identi not identify any substitutes which were clearly safer at the time. But, uh, but people can, and businesses can take steps to reduce exposure and use. Um, I think BPS has some of the studies are showing similar uh, uptake by the body when uh, when, when um, BPS containing receipts are handled by uh, are handled by humans. Um, we're concerned about those most exposed cashiers. Often cashiers are are women, and they're that's another one of the vulnerable populations especially young, childbearing age, uh, women, nursing women, children are also vulnerable. Um, and again, total loadings over life cycle. Uh, thermal paper, we're not really clear how much of the BPA we find in the environment is traces to thermal paper use. But it is one of the contributors, so, uh, and, and one that we can uh, can work on, so that's that's why we're working on it. Um, so in this project, which went uh, basically, I think it was 2012, 2013, um, it was voluntary. We were focused on the hospitality sector, so uh, groceries, primarily restaurants, um, operations like that. We provided financial assistance to help uh, with small grants to uh, help people switch to digital receipts. We really tried to feature the digital options since uh, there were no clearly safer chemical substitutes uh, um, with, uh, with supplies readily available in the marketplace at the time. So we, uh, we were uh, 
starting with the switch to, to digital receipts. And we collected baseline metrics on amount of paper and helped people by testing their papers. Uh, at the time, we were trying to get a, a baseline of uh, typical amounts of BPA or BPS and what the, what the uh, split was between BPA and BPS in uh, the thermal paper being used at, at the time. Um, we provided information on other strategies, supported companies in trying to implement them and reached out to a network of uh, proactive companies. Sorry about the misspelling there. Um, so uh, there remain plenty of companies to, uh, who we can still work with on this kind of thing and I think it's uh, we're going to start uh, working to other networks and, and trying to promote more of this switching in uh, thermal paper in the, in the next year or two. So this is our um, this is our web page on the project and its supporting materials. In the middle there, there's a in here. This is a, the toolkit that that's available that sprang out of the past project. I think much of this will be uh, useful uh, in moving forward in, in future with new companies. Uh, easy videos there for uh, companies to understand the issues. In, a, in, a, in short order and understand strategies and so on, and some uh, reports from our past work. And, uh, so that's there as a resource for anybody, but we'll be uh, keeping that updated, updated and fresh as we move forward with new audiences. Um, and in addition to the digital receipt, uh, electric e-receipt kind of option, um, there are these simple steps that companies can take to, to minimize uh, receipt generation and, and use. You know, simply make your default no receipt and ask customers if they need a receipt and only print it if they say yes. Um, and don't print a merchant copy of tra if the transaction is already being kept electronically. We found that re repeatedly that uh, there is both electronic and hard copy records and really no, uh, the companies could not find any real reason to have, have both. So it was an easy thing to eliminate. And for, at the employee level, minimize the handling, minimize the grip, the strength of the grip and the wiping. Don't crumple. <laughs> if you're, a, if you're a, sometimes when you're, when you're getting started, your uh, your machines are still by default printing receipts. You ask if they need a receipt, they say no, and uh, it can be a habit to crumple a receipt and throw it in the in the in the waste basket. So crumpling again, minimize friction and wiping and grip. Um, doesn't help to use cleaners on your hands or uh, and keeping them free of lotion and all that avoids transfer and. Uh, Employees can use gloves if that's acceptable, um, necessary for for them, or um, and, and doesn't uh, and works for the customers as well. Um, so here are some of the results of the of our past work that um, you get significant reductions of of volume of paper um, just from these simple actions. 8 to 37% reduction by not automatically getting receipts and, and uh, not printing the merchant copy. That's 50% reduction. Switching to e-receipts, somewhat of a, of a reduction. Um, we have not found a company which, of course, can dispense with uh, a receipt printer altogether. There will always that has to be there. There will always be somebody who wants receipts. So. Uh, it, it uh, can't be a total re elimination that way. Um, Double-sided thermal paper uh, and switch to non-phenol paper. This uh, you can get virtually 100% reduction of the, the phenols, BPA and VPS, um, but with little or no paper reduction. Um, based on limited data from our project participants, uh, again, these businesses were voluntary, uh, voluntarily 
participating in uh, any data they gave us was also voluntary, so um, we didn't get a, a lot of information, but from, from the eight businesses who provided it, uh, you can see the reductions there in terms of amount of paper and uh, the amount of BPA and BPS reduced in pounds and 10 to 30 percent overall from their current practice. Fourteen other partners uh, who didn't get to the implementation in the course of the project could do further reduction as you see there, another uh, one to three thousand pounds of paper and, and more amounts of, uh, of the chemicals. And uh, we're, as I mentioned, we're, fan, we're planning a further, further promotion to new audiences. Um, we've also worked uh, with at least one large retailer, um, uh, with, with Best Buy, which is uh, headquartered here in, uh, in the Twin Cities. And uh, they have uh, since then gone to e-receipts, pushing them primarily, and uh, went on phenol. Uh, in terms of the chemical developer on the, the receipt paper they were still using. And uh, based on, on their information, we think big stores like them can reduce significant amounts of, of the chemicals, two to five tons per year, and, uh, and lots of papers you can see there, a million plus rolls a year. Um, and we, we have done some really, I guess, uh, I don't want to feature these estimates at the bottom of this slide too heavily, but um, estimates of thermal paper use are, are sketchy. And, but based on what we found in our project, if you had similar types of reductions, you could see similar uh, or um, significant amounts of tons of paper uh, used, uh, reduced rather, and uh, and tons of endocrine active chemical use reduction as well. Um, the long-term metrics um, will be a challenge. Um, we will need resources to keep tracking. We will need continuing resources to do environmental monitoring and, and biomonitoring. Um, but you know, uh, we can we can look at the reduction end of things project by project, company by company, but our stakeholders really want to know if this is this kind of work, and we really want to know if this kind of work is having an effect on levels found in the environment and in humans, or, or the incidence of of us finding them in those places. Um, we can also try to monitor the data on the quantities of, of BPA and BPA, BPS used through EPA's chemical data reporting or other sources, but um, that has not proven terribly useful, so I don't, I'm not counting on that as a good metric into, into the future. But we are uh, committed to, to keeping an eye on this and, and trying to understand if, uh, if, if our project efforts are having noticeable effect. So uh, that's the first one I wanted to go to describe to you here. The next one is a, a totally different area, but uh, again, coding, I guess, that's similar. But uh, it's pavement seal coats made from, based on coal tar pitch. And uh, coal tar pitch contains very high levels of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. Again, a long-standing um, contaminant in the environment, but uh, most of the work we've done on it is on legacy issues and remediation uh, of soils and contaminated sediments. Um, but there are still these active uh, sources, and uh, this is, seems like the most preventable one. Here's some basics on seal coats. As you know, it's a black liquid spread on asphalt pavements, not on concrete. Excuse me while I take a drink. Um, it's used primarily on non-road surfaces, um, driveways, parking lots, playgrounds, etc. cetera. Uh, highway departments, public works departments will use asphalt-based um, 
material that's similar, very, very similar to a seal coat, but usually they also apply stone. Um, so it's, I, don't, I think it's virtually never that, uh, that seal coat is used by itself on a road or a highway. Um, seal coat is used, has been used especially in suburban areas, again, driveways and parking lots. Coal tar based seal coats, CTS, that's the shorthand for coal tar seal coats. CTSs are not typically used on public roadways. It's a really started use around 1960 and peaked around 2000, probably declining since, certainly where uh, restrictions are now in place. Um, and typically mostly used east of the Rockies where uh, a lot of steel making, uh, the use of coal for coking, um, and the production of coal tar pitch out of the coking as a byproduct of the coking process. A lot of that happened east of the Rockies, particularly in the Great Lakes. So um, this is why the project that we started this work with back in 2011 was uh, supported out of uh, the Great Lakes program in Region 5 at EPA. And, and thanks to them for that support. And that, that project was focused on the Great Lakes area. Um, in 2007, based on industry data, industry sources, coal tar seal coat industry sources, 85 million gallons per year of the seal coat was, of coal tar was sold in, U in the U.S. Again, probably declined since then somewhat, but um, that's the best industry-based data we have. And again, we're getting kind of old, so not, but again, we don't have much that's accurate from more recent, so this is what we still go with. So if uh, at 5% PAH by weight, that would calculate to 50 million pounds of PAH is applied to paved surfaces east of the Rockies per year. And um, much of that is released by vaporization in the first week or so of uh, after application, weathering over time, tire wear, plowing, and so on. Um, work done here by my colleague Judy Crane um, assayed uh, PAH sources in stormwater pond sediments, taking samples in, I believe it was 2011 or 12 thereabouts, and the report uh, and analysis finished in 2013. But this pie chart, um, you can look at the blue part, and that's the blue. The blue is what is attributable to coal tar based sealant uh, in the stormwater pond sediments. So other active sources are vehicle emissions and a little bit from uh, wood burning, but um, coal tar was the primary contributor in urban area uh, stormwater sediments um, at, at the time. So again, a preventable source. This is an interesting picture of, uh, of sediments being dug out of a, out of a stormwater pond in the, in the northeast quadrant of the Twin Cities area here. Um, we have a lot of these stormwater catchments that have been uh, constructed over a lot of them in the suburbs where there's room to, to do so over the uh, you know 20 to 40 years of uh, urbanization that's gone on in the area. And so that's plenty of time for these stormwater catchments to, to catch a lot of sediment, particularly near the outfalls. And so um, uh, this is uh, <laughs> becoming a more common sight to have to clean these out to retain the volume of the stormwater pond and to, and to get rid of the sediment. And when the sediment is highly contaminated with, uh, with PAHs, it can no longer uh, be burned or disposed of on site. It has to be trucked to a line landfill. So rule of thumb now is about 50 bucks a yard. And if, uh, if you're doing digging out 10,000 cubic yards, in, in this case, as is pictured, 
in this pond, uh, you can see the cost add up quickly. So this is just a quick summary of the case for action on, on coal tar based sealants, the PAH effects, you know, you're probably familiar with the, the uh, both environmental and human impacts, cancer and developmental. Um, as I mentioned, the stormwater ponds need maintenance. There's a huge, greatly increased <laughs> cost of clean out and proper management, and that was a huge driver of interest and activity on uh, coal tar steel coats here in, uh, in Minnesota. 50% uh, or more, 60%, over 60% in our area, uh, traceable to coal tar sealants um, used in our area. It's preventable and safer substitutes exist, which are comparable in performance and cost. So, um, so in, from 2011 to 2014, we ran this, this project with the EPA money and with partners both here in Minnesota and in Wisconsin and Michigan, and uh, reached out to these kinds of audiences, uh, the coal tar uh, pitch providers and the seal coat makers who uh, did not want to play ball with, with us. We uh, appealed to re retailers and distributors, both uh, national home, uh, home uh, supply retailers like uh, Home Depot, Lowe's, True Value, et cetera, but also smaller retails, retailers, especially in Michigan and regional distributors. Uh, we appealed to contractors and applicators seeking to get them to pledge not to apply uh, to coal tar. Um, we provided guidance for pavement owners, whether citizens or commercial owners, of, on safer alternatives and, uh, and better application. Um, did education and made appeals to many types of buyers and groups, school districts, shopping centers, various types of businesses, places of worship, um, municipalities and colleges. Um, we made some uh, outreach too. I think that could uh, more of that could be done, and then uh, direct and indirect kind of uh, outreach to to residents, depending on the uh, the location. More of that was done in Michigan, <clears throat> and this is the uh, the web page that we're, we continue to maintain. So these resources are, are available to anyone who needs to use them. And it, on the right, you can see, see the topics that are available, choosing alternatives, finding the contractors who are applying safer seal code, um, moving to safer alternatives, and, and things like that. So um, that's we're going to continue to maintain that. Um, this is a map that's on the site that shows in pink where there are policies or restrictions by either colleges or uh, local units of government. Uh, Minnesota is pink in the upper northwest because we now have a statewide ban as of uh, uh, 2014. And then in green are uh, contractors who, who have pledged not to apply coal tar seal coat. And then in black are suppliers who pledge not to sell. So the idea here is to uh, link, is to create more po uh, points on the map over time, but then also to, to link uh, people seeking safer products with those who can provide them and to give them a leg up. So um, that resource is available. We'll continue to maintain that. So lessons learned from the project and still to be learned if there are regulatory and market drivers in place, providers are more responsive. That was certainly the case here in Minnesota where there was far more attention and concern. Where the drivers are not in place, you need to start with education of various types of groups. Uh, we'll continue to provide more assistance in and outside of Minnesota. Um, I won't touch on the last one. There's a new substitute which is also high in PAH. is not as bad as coal tar, but certainly not as good as uh, asphalt based in terms of level of PAH. So um, that's something we're keeping an eye on as the, as the market shifts. These are some of our metrics from the project. Um, I won't get into these. These, again, are, are good if you can uh, gather the information. Again, this is just like the BPA project, a fairly small 
uh, group actually gave us information. But you can do some extrapolation. But in the long term, we need to uh, keep working on compliance in the here state where we have the statewide ban and, uh, and elsewhere. And those pink spots on the map, all those folks will be working on compliance. And we, if we can, at all, can do it, we need to do follow-up sediment monitoring. Um, our ban started in 2014, so maybe 10 years from now, put that on the calendar and try to uh, resource that to do the follow-up sediment monitoring. A ban in, in Austin, Texas, which went into place in 2016 or 20, 2006, they did some follow-up work at, uh, recently after eight years and found a 58% decline in coal tar pH is, um, in the areas they'd studied before. And these are some of the resources we have available um, on our page and, and, uh, and through the USGS webpage. Um, the final project I wanted to talk about is not really something we can take uh, credit for in terms of uh, actually promoting reductions, but it's we've been trying to track because of concerns about monophenol in Minnesota's environment. We've been trying to see where use of NPEs, monophenol ethoxylates, is still prevalent and to try to understand that whether that's on its way out or not. And if it's not, then to promote reductions. So this is kind of a, 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 a bit of sleuthing to figure out where we're at on, on the sources of these uh, types of compounds. Um, Nonophenol ethoxylates are, uh, are a group of compounds, and they are surfactants, and they're used as surfactants in, in very a lot of applications, as you can see here. Um, but we focused on the surfactant and detergent use, which is highlighted there in the, in the upper left. And down below here, as it suggests, nonophenol ethoxylates degrade fairly readily, but then they degrade to nonophenol, which is much more persistent and stable and has, a, has greater endocrine activity and, uh, and toxicity effects than NPEs themselves. So, so these are some of the effects of nonophenol. This is from the Pharos uh, webpage at pharosproject.net, so give them credit for pulling this resource together. But you can see uh, persistence, PBT, developmental, reproductive, endocrine, eye irritation, acute aquatic, chronic aquatic, mammalian, terrestrial, there's a, you know, anywhere from medium to very high effects across a broad range of, uh, of endpoints in uh, humans and, and, uh, and organisms in the environment. So we focused on MPEs and detergents, and that has been going on, this focus has been going on for time. Um, so while they're not regulated, they have been gradually eliminated in the 1980s from consumer detergents. And then uh, in uh, this, this century, um, through stewardship initiatives by both the industrial laundry sector, so off-site laundries, uh, uniforms, rugs, uh, linens, things like that that do large volumes under contract to, uh, to, uh, to uh, companies other types of companies, um, they are a major user, user, and EPA worked with them to agree to, to do phase-out of NPE surfactants in, in uh, liquid and then solid detergents used by industrial laundries. Um, in 2010, the industrial laundries committed again to end use. We surveyed our industrial laundries um, in, in the state of Minnesota in 2013 and confirmed that most of them had already eliminated MPEs at that point. Only a couple had not yet. We looked at those reductions. Um, we were able to, from the major facilities, we were able to get a lot of good data on the amount they had used previously. And so 12 of those uh, major facilities reported in aggregate 323 tons per year reduction of MPEs, surfactants, and their detergents. 
So seven of those 12 discharged to the main metro wastewater treatment plant, which on this map serves the area in kind of in the middle there with the most number of dots with that kind of that dark uh, yellow or puce. I don't know what the color is, yellow orange. Um, and so even though, so those seven in that area reduced 179 tons per year, but we went and looked at the metro plant influent and found little significant reduction in MPAE levels coming into the into that plant. So that was a bit of a, a head scratcher given that much reduction. Um, so we looked through other parts of the puzzle trying to understand where hotels might be at that time. It showed many laundering in house. Some were using NPEs. We had other tests on branches of the metro plant with dominated by domestic or household wastewater sources and found low level of NPE there. So we switched back and said, well, let's keep working on commercial and institutional sources like, uh, like detergents. And so last, earlier this year, well, late last year and earlier this year, we, we got some wonderful local college student interns to uh, help us survey and phone interview and email interview, in, uh, survey various types of providers, manufacturers and distributors and users focusing on hospitals, clinics, surgical centers, nursing homes, long-term care, hotels, folks with a lot of linen, a lot of laundry, and, uh, and associations of those types, types of users. So between the time we had done some calling in 2013 on two hotels and then 2016 this year, there's been a lot of movement, which is, which is good to know. That, uh, and, and heartening that uh, the larger centrally managed hotels, hospitals, and long-term care systems have uh, drawn this into their sustainability programs and driven it into purchasing to, uh, to demand no, non-NPE uh, detergents. Uh, there's more isolated use, particularly outside the Twin Cities. There's some, some sectors we could uh, do additional follow-up with. Um, but, you know, one facility we assisted reduced about 120 pounds per year of NPE or about 1.5 pounds per patient bed per year. This being a hospital and nursing home combined laundry. So um, if you total up the number of beds theoretically in the state of Minnesota, overall the total reductions will not be on the same scale as uh, the industrial laundries, more like 30 to 50 tons perhaps in total. But we've decided we will go ahead, given this apparent progress, and retest the influent at the metro plant. Um, and that will happen uh, actually starting next week. And we should have results in December. So hopefully we'll see some, some change in, uh, in the levels of not of all and not often all of that coming into that plant. Um, and again, influent monitoring is one of our longer term metrics. Um, we found nonethanol in the environment, so we'll keep monitoring that to see if there's some declines, and we'll monitor other data sources to, to see if we can see some trends in overall use. Um, so once you do these kinds of projects, if you're going to, uh, to follow the metrics, then it's a long-term commitment, so again, we have to find the resources to do this and, and hold on to that commitment. So um, this is just some of what could be next for nonophenol ethoxylates if we uh, decide to continue working on, uh, on trying to find, figure out where they're used. The ones in red, the pesticides, particularly row crop being in a farm state, um, and the paper in paper processing could be others others that uh, relatively big hitters that we could work on next, but the rest is, uh, is really dispersed and, and could be hard to get at, so I don't know. Stay tuned on that. So that's uh, where I want to end. Like I said, there are many more uh, slides back here on the road salt use, but I'm not going to get into that. Uh, I just want to thank you for your time and attention and ask if there are questions, which hopefully I can answer. 
Okay, well, thank you very much, Al. We appreciate your talk, very informative. Um, I'll see if there's questions here from the audience. Um, I have one first I'll start out with. I was just wondering if there, the US EPA or any group uh, is pushing for changes nationally uh, with large companies or retailers uh, related to the um, thermal paper question and have, you know, doing more to push them to change all to non-phenol paper or electronic receipts. Is there a national effort like the one you have in Minnesota? Not that I'm aware of. The uh, EPA did their alternatives assessment study a few years ago, and that was uh, in that they bring together representatives of you know of the whole supply chain um, from providers to uh, to the buyers, um, and uh, they all discuss the issues, uh, look for uh, assess the alternatives. They didn't get to a clearly safer one there, so that's kind of where they've kind of where they've left it. And uh, um, I, I'm not aware of any big national push for um, thermal papers. Okay, thank you. Uh, we have a question here in the audience. Hello. Is there any epidemiological evidence about uh, about the hazards of these materials? Yeah, there's a. Uh, been studies of, particularly on the endocrine activity um, for BPA, um, some on BPS, on monophenol, um, PAHs have been well studied. It's a huge group of compounds, of course, and so uh, some of them have been a lot more studied than others, but uh, the ones typically tracked are well studied as carcinogens and some developmental effects and and now more uh, linkage to uh, developmental issues as well for PAHs. So there's um, these are these are generally on most jurisdictions, uh, a number of states, US, Europe, and individual countries and also in Asia, it's, it, these are common, uh, commonly targeted um, contaminants. Okay, um, thank you. Um, another question here that I'll, I'll read is um, when you mentioned about the cleanup of that one pond in Minnesota, um, are there, and then you showed the cost for all of the ponds in Minnesota, are there efforts by Minnesota to clean up those ponds or are you just going to see if you can do some monitoring studies to see the decrease like Austin did? Well, there are efforts to slowly clean out those <laughs> ponds. Um, it's expensive and the cities uh, responsible for them typically have to scrape together the money and, you know, plan this all out into the future and it's going to take a lot of time but we are at the state level putting pressure on them to maintain those ponds as part of our stormwater management programs. They, they have to, uh, the ponds have to slow down flow, they have to uh, hold volume and they have to trap pollutants and if they're filled in they don't provide those functions and, and it's uh, doesn't work with our, our stormwater program. So they're under that pressure and they've got to got to keep chipping away at this. But um, you know that, that cost will be spread out over time. And uh, if you left the pollutants in place, the, you'd get new sediments and those are the ones which you would then, uh, in addition to the older ones, you could compare the newer ones to the older ones and the profiles of the PAHs new versus old and see that kind of trend um, as well. So I hope that answers the question. Okay, and then one other question related to that is um, the US EPA, again, do they have any mandates on cleanup of PAHs at certain levels in ponds or the environment, or is this more of a state-by-state -state basis? I honestly do. I'm not a specialist in uh, in that program. I, I work with it, but uh, so I'm not sure I'm clear on what EPA requirements are. Um, 
there are, as I mentioned, uh, coal tar PAHs are heavy and would precipitate out. They're attached to particles. They'd be concentrated in the, you know, sort of the delta, the outfall, where the stormwater is coming into the into the pond. So typically, you do a, you know, in the, in the winter, the pond is drained. You go out there and you do a grid of sampling, and you can isolate where the high pH, um, highest pH uh, sediments are, and then those you can uh, manage in the lying landfill separately. Others can be disposed of as, uh, as daily cover or even on site when they're lower in pH. But we have, we have uh, health-based standards for, uh, that apply to, to sediments and, and, and sediment disposal here at the state level. Okay. And then, um, one other question um, here relates to um, the NPEs in you know Minnesota seems to be doing a lot uh, in a very systematic study of those again is there any national efforts uh, similar to Minnesota's effort um, because it seems like nationally if, if uh, we were working with the large detergent companies etc that would make greater strides for everyone mm. um. Well, I think uh, <laughs> I think we're kind of a I think we're on our own on this for now. Um, EPA is always interested in what we've been doing and following up on their wonderful initiative with the industrial laundries. Um, so I think we were the only state to really follow up and see how that implementation of the phase out was going. And, and did the influent monitoring on our own, pass that on the EPA. They were somewhat surprised that there had not been a change in the influent levels. Um, so we're, I think we're helping them out with some, some new information. Um, it was heartening to see that the, the big regional, um, or at least state or multi-state uh, Healthcare systems were moving forward on this very, uh, very, uh, very well here, at least in, in the Upper Midwest, um, and that the hotel chains um, were doing quite well on that as as well. So that's uh, and and EPA probably deserves some credit, particularly with the hotels. They've done work with them in the past for sending sending those signals. So. Um, I think uh, I think we're likely to try to look at at uh, pesticides, the uh, use of NPEs as surfactants in, in pesticides, and, and again paper processing perhaps, um, and and try to push that information to EPA. But uh, boy, it's really hard to get detailed information sector by sector on the volumes being used and the trends, you know, if, if there are substitutions going on, what, uh, where they're going on and, and what they're going to. So um, it's a bit of uh, groping in the dark, quite frankly. Okay. Um, and is that study you're doing on the MPEs, is that funded by <clears throat> your Minnesota Pollution Control Agency by the state or have you been able yes. to find sponsors? Okay. All right. Um, let me check if there's any other questions uh, online. Okay. Uh, seeing no other no other questions, I'd like to conclude today. And again, uh, thank you, Al, for your talk. Um, and we'll look forward to everyone who would like to attend or view the next upcoming seminar on November 10th, which will be about. Um, <clears throat> PCBs in the environment with some studies done in the Chicago area. So thank you very much.